afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Dalton, and as Michael introduced me, I'm the candidate advanced nurse practitioner here in Harrods Cross. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of comprehensive geriatric assessment. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about it, but just to kind of just give you a kind of a definition of what it is and where it's, and Helen will go through where it's um, been shown to be beneficial. So just to kind of introduce it, it's an organized approach to assessment designed to determine an older person's medical conditions, mental health, functional capacity, and social circumstances. The purpose of it is to implement a coordinated plan of treatment, rehabilitation support, and long-term follow-up. The full evaluation of a frail older person by a team of healthcare professionals can identify a variety of treatable health problems, lead to a coordinated plan of care, and achieve better outcomes for the older person. CGA originated in orthogeriatric services in Hastings in the 1960s, when an orthogeriatric surgeon collaborated with a geriatrician to manage orthopedic problems in older people with concurrent medical issues. Over the last 30 years, it has evolved, it's become more refined, and it's been implemented in a number of fields with very successful outcomes. And as I say, Helen will go through that in the second part of the presentation. It is the gold standard and best practice for managing frailty. The National Clinical Programme for Older People recommends that all older, all older adults identified as being frail and at risk of frailty should have a timely CGA performed and documented in their permanent health care record. It's strongly supported by, sorry, I, strongly supported by research and 22 research trials involving 10,000 patients over six countries identified older adults that received CGA were more likely to remain living at home, more likely to experience better cognition, less likely to be institutionalized and less likely to experience overall deterioration. So just looking at the slide here, who performs a CGA? Well, generally it does require a team approach but areas differ depending on the resources available to them. Teams can be made up of any mix of the interprofessional team that's identified there on the slide. In most settings, if available, a geriatrician will have responsibility um, for team leadership. However, it can be initiated by any member of the interprofessional team. The team is responsible for the coordinated assessment, discussion, recommendation, and implementation of a treatment plan and a full physical assessment of the older person is carried out. Together, the team creates a comprehensive plan of care in collaboration with the patient and the family. And that's very important. Again, you have to have buy-in from the patient around kind of the interventions, the goal setting and the, the plan follow-up. So just the elements of it, it's multidimensional. And you can see here again from the slide, all the aspects um, it uses an interprofessional approach. The core domains include the functional status, mobility, gait speed, and we've, we've heard a lot about that already this morning, and review of the geriatric syndromes, cognition, polypharmacy, and fall. It's both a diagnostic and a treatment process. However, performing an assessment is only one part of CGA. The goal direction and the follow through are critical components of it. And this is, this is what allows the older person to set their goals. For example, a goal for an older person may be that they want to be able to independently make a cup of tea for themselves in their own home. They may actually just want to be able to get back out of the house again if they've had a recent fall. Or even going to mass or being able to get back on the bus can be a, a real goal for an older person. It allows the healthcare professional to determine if the goals set are realistic and achievable. And planned follow-up allows the team to assess the impact of intervention and make any necessary changes to the plan of care. The four main dimensions covered in CGA should include, um, you know, a full assessment, as I said already, physical, functional, psychological, <laughs> and social support. And the use of validated assessment tool um, just make objective measurement better and you can determine whether or not there's improvement or there's decline. 
So just when you're doing a kind of, you know, a physical assessment of the person, it's important to take in what's the presenting complaints, you know, past medical history. Have they had any recent falls, recent hospitalizations? Um, but really what's very important, and we look at it here, just kind of the, the medication review. We know that polypharmacy in the, in the older population is a serious concern. Um, often when we meet people in the clinic, they come in with a list of medications um, that they've been on for a very long time. And it's really about looking at kind of, are they, do they need to be on them first and foremost? Um, when was the last review that they had? Are they able to adhere to the medication program? Sometimes making a phone call to the pharmacy to check if they're actually regularly filling the prescription. Are they in a blister pack just to make it easier for them to take it? But the, the biggest question is, do they need to be on all those tablets? Um, important again, and it was mentioned earlier, you know, in the older population, are they in pain? Are they, are they taking any regular analgesia or do they use non-pharmacological methods of controlling their pain, heat and cold packs? Ask about herbal remedies and over-the-counter medications. Again, older people may not realize that these can have like adverse kind of reactions with their regular prescriptions that they're taking. Often, sometimes what we forget to discuss is advanced care planning. So again, looking at has, has the older person the ability to put their legal affairs in order? What are their wishes and have they been able to express them to a family member? Oops, sorry, just sorry back there. When we look at a, fu a functional assessment, we're, we're going to kind of just an overview of their activities of daily living. And you're really trying to establish how are they actually managing at home? Sometimes, you know, they don't give you the full picture and you have to ask probing questions like simple things. Are you able to have a bath or a shower? And you might say, or do you actually wash at the sink? Um, so giving them the option to tell you exactly how they're managing. Sometimes if they are only able to wash at the sink, but they can't get into the bath or into the shower, they might be a little bit embarrassed that you might judge them. So it's just kind of asking the questions in a way that you're going to gain their trust so that they give you a true picture of how they're managing. We've talked a lot about balance and again it's important to take an in-depth history as often older people may not report a fall if they haven't sustained any injury they may not even talk about it as being a fall and you often hear older people say no I didn't fall I just slipped or I eased myself down onto the floor you know to us that's that's a fall um, and again just questions about do they ever get dizzy when they stand up Around psychological, psychosocial, then just determine whether or not the older person is suffering from a low mood. It could be a simple thing that they can't get out of the house, causing them to feel very down in themselves. Establish whether they, they take alcohol. And again, trying to get a clear picture of how much alcohol are they actually taking? And like most of us, when we go to the doctor, when you say you take, take two to three glasses of wine, it's probably double that for so what we say. So kind of, you know, um, obviously intake of alcohol that can contrib contribute to low mood and increase the risk of falling. You also around mood and kind of capacity. You have to determine whether the older person has the capacity and the motivation to follow through with the treatment plan that you're setting them. The social piece is very important, looking at their living arrangements. Are there supports in place? Do they have meals on wheels? Do they have home health? Um, if not, could they be provided? But again, it's all about balancing like what the what the person wants, you know, so some older people just don't want strangers coming to their house and they may actually think, you know, that that's that's a job that their family should be doing, you know, providing them with that support. But as we know, that can increase kind of care or strain. So, again, you have to just look into what is the kind of relationship with the carer? Do they live close by and are they supportive? Assess how does the older person manage their finances, especially if there is evidence of cognitive impairment. So just a, a quick look there at kind of who benefits most from a CGA and just looking at the clinical frailty scale, you're aiming to determine who will benefit most from it, you know, and you can see clearly here that it, it ranges from categories one to nine and one to three. So that's kind of your very fit older person to your older person who's managing well with medical problems, but 
but they're get they're fine. They don't actually need a CGA. Um, you see the category seven to nine. So you have your severely frail person to your terminally ill person. They're more likely to require long term or palliative palliative care. But the category there that we'd be most focused on around CGA would be the vulnerable, the mild frail, or the moderately frail, because they're the the people that we can kind of you know come in um, with with the assessment and kind of either reverse or treat and increase their kind of improve their function and maximize their staying at home for longer. However, the research does suggest that the specifics of the geriatric assessment process is less important than the very act of systematically approaching older people with the belief that improvement is possible. Um, I'm going to now pass you over to my colleague, Helen, who will go through where it's been proven to have very successful outcomes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, my name is Helen Tuvey. I'm a clinical nurse specialist here in Harold's Cross. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on three specific areas that CGA has proven to have positive outcomes for patients. So firstly, we'll talk about frailty. Frailty where you have um, the multiple body systems have lost their inbuilt reserve or people feel like they have lost ground or not as uh, robust as they used to be. And frailty, it can actually affect up to 10% of over 65 year olds, but this rises to about 50% of the over 85 year olds. And although it's more common in older people, it's not an inevitable part of aging. So certain conditions can be treated or even reversed in some cases. So it's very important to do our assessment to identify these areas. Moving on to hip fracture, we heard a lot about hip fracture and fracture liaison services. So using a CGA, we can actually um, highlight modifiable medical conditions. So um, with our older population, we're going to see more hip fractures occur and consequences can be have an adverse um, effect on their mortality. So traditionally, people may have just focused on the actual surgical aspect, but with orthogeriatrics, you have collaboration between orthopedics and geriatricians. And with the interdisciplinary approach, management of hip fracture will ensure the appropriate treatment for the patient. If we looked at polypharmacy, I suppose we're just um, focused on polypharmacy because a lot of people who we would deal with are on multiple medications, whether they actually need them still or not. Of course, our consultant geriatrician helps us with the rationalizing those. We look at risk of delirium. If we have a baseline cognitive status, we can then identify who would be at risk of developing a delirium and notice it in a timely manner. Looking at adequate analgesia for the older population, then we may uh, veer away from the opioid analgesia because of respiratory depression, confusion, and maybe towards IV paracetamol has been proven very effective. Choice of anaesthetic. Um, so for the more frail person, a general anaesthetic might not be indicated. They might be looking more for spinal or nerve blocks in those cohort. So postoperatively, early mobilization is the key. So you're hoping to get the patient mobilized on the day of or the day after surgery. The earlier we can, the, the better the outcome for the patient. Again, looking at things like hydration and nutrition, the person may have low body mass index before the fracture. So if we can um, supplement their diet, as we heard this morning with lysine and protein, we can help build uh, muscle mass. Looking at discharge plans, we have to see what the setup of the patient was pre-op to see is there a chance the person can get back home living independently? Will they require rehabilitation? Do they need extra services put in at home? So a, a plan needs to be put in as early as possible. So, of course, addressing the cause of the hip fracture is paramount. We're looking if it was a fall, why did the patient fall? Do they need a full falls assessment? Um, looking at their medication, again, it could cause falls. And bone health, uh, I suppose after a hip fracture, we know the person no doubt has uh, osteoporosis. So appropriate treatment and adherence to treatment and toleration of treatment would be vital. And uh, by following the proper pathways, as we can see there in the UK with the hip fracture database, 30-day mortality rates have significantly reduced down from 8.2 to 6.4% over about an eight-year period. So very significant to have this collaborative approach. Preoperatively, so with our increasing uh, number of older people, more people will require surgery. So for elective surgery, it gives us the time to optimize the person's function and identify any reversible medical issues. 
So some of these are just repetitive again, we're definitely going to look at their uh, medications, their cognition, um, falls, nutrition, continence, and what kind of care have they already set up at home? So post-operatively, how is our dis discharge plan going to look? Are we going to have issues with discharging? Will we need convalescence? Will the patient regain uh, function afterwards? Will they remain independent? And by performing a CGA, it can have a very positive impact on post-op outcomes. In St. Thomas's Hospital in London, um, they had a, a proactive care of the older person undergoing surgery. And in this cohort of people, there were many multiple comorbidities, but with comprehensive geriatric assessment and the holistic approach, they reduced mortality rates, reduced side of our complications such as pneumonia, and actually reduced bed days by 4.5%, which is very significant and cost effective. Moving into oncology then. So with uh, cancer, a lot, half the diagnosed cancer, new cancer diagnosis are in the over 65 year old population. So just the age alone does not to tell us the person's ability or fitness to withstand chemotherapy or any aggressive therapies. So by doing a CGA, we can actually uh, identify the fit older person. They may be absolutely well placed to withstand uh, cancer treatments, even be included in clinical trials where maybe in the past an age may have been a cutoff point. Of course, any core morbidities, if things can be analyzed or reversed, maybe treatments can be modified for those patients. So if there's low body mass index, uh, they may be more at risk of toxicity or maybe with renal impairment. So we may have to be very careful and modify the treatments. But with the CGA evaluating it, we were well placed to um, respond to any incidences in a timely manner, provide interventions and improve the overall outcome. So by doing the assessment is fabulous, but you always have to implement the plan and have a follow up to make sure the plan is working. So just to recap, you'd be glad to know. So by doing our CGA, we can identify issues such as frailty. We've seen the figures there in how early diagnosis of frailty and interventions can have better outcomes with hip fracture, oncology, surgery. It can be used across a wide variety of areas. These are just three areas we focused on today. And our real overall goal is to maximize the health of the older person and not just assume all older people are frail because the free frail can really benefit from active treatment. That's it.